Hello everybody, this is A7X Fan Ben, and welcome back to the hourly campaign. I believe this is session 16. I'm just going to check YouTube to make sure it goes live. And who knows if the stream house will be okay, but last time it worked out pretty well, and even though it said encoding overloaded on OBS a couple times, or at least once I believe, it uh, the, the recording is on YouTube and it works fine, so right now it seems okay. And yeah, it says unsupported resolution, but it said that last time, and it worked out okay. So for now, I'm basically just going to wing it, because I really want to play this game. And not many people are watching or keeping track of it anyway, which I completely understand. Um, so, let's see. Okay, I'm, let's not get into my customs. I was already having fun with those yesterday. Alright, so, get the Corsairs are up next. Uh, at least they're pretty sure. Yeah, turn 16, I'm on the Corsairs now. They've got a home island west of the Ring of Fire, even though, and the Ring of Fire is in the middle, of course, right there, even though they sailed in from the southeast, they whirlpooled away from a location they didn't really like very much, so, alrighty. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, so the Pharaoh's Legacy is headed towards the Ring of Fire right now, actually. And then the Tangier headed towards this island here. I don't think she has any exploring capabilities. She has island treasure trading and secret hold, and she's got a helmsman, and then a random UT that doesn't matter yet. So she'll just dock at the island, and then I think the Stellar is that American ship there. I don't think she has an explorer either, I don't think. So I think the Corsairs will be the first to discover a resource on this island. As you can see from the black marker, the pirates actually explored it with the Brigands Nation and got the turtles, but they message in a bottle took the Brigands Nation to the northeast corner of the map before uh, the pirates were able to roll for the resource value of the island. So, anyway, yeah, the stream house is already better than, in, you know, the, the red color, so. Okay, so the Corsairs just move. Nothing exciting going on with them. And let me see who's next, just to make sure. So the Jade Rebellion is next, even though they're more of the east. Generally, the turns are the faction turns are happening in like a, a clockwise direction from the northwest corner, but it's a little bit different because the Corsairs got a home island away from where they started. All right, so the Jade Rebellion is off to a very good start. They're doing quite well, and they've got. Some really good assets already. The Sea Panda is about to roll for the Frond of Fisaga. And she's got Nemo's plans aboard. Oh, she gets the Frond. So she on a 5 or 6, the ship gets plus LL to its base move. And she's already got SS speed with a Helmsman. So she's going to go SS. And then another S. L. And then the final L will get her all the way to this island here. I'm just going to move S, and that's going to be plenty to talk there. She's got some other UTs, too. Um, I'm trying to remember. There's so many UTs, so it's tough to keep track of. She has at least one that Nemo's Plans does apply to. I think it was Spices, because she already used it. Yeah, Spices. So that's cool. So they don't have to remove it, because of Nemo's Plans. Marksman's Map, which I'll do in a moment here. I think I'll load up resources first. Runes of Power, so two shoot actions. Nice. And I think it's supposed to say, cannot use their abilities. And then I think, yeah, you definitely have to remove Runes of Power. So I should get the full flavor text from that from the Master Spreadsheet. Um, let me... If you hear any noises in the background, we have a small dog. Um, so that's kind of what you're hearing. If there's any extra background noise, though, sorry about that. But whatever, just a casual live stream of the campaign as usual, so not a big deal. Kind of funny if I could show them actually. Um, so Runes of Power, I'm going to look at the master spreadsheet to get full ability text. Okay, so I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to keep up that pace I had last time where I was playing turns at a pretty quick pace, get through a bunch of stuff. So this is the final turn of this resource duration roll. That's what the one coin in the top left means. 
And with a four roll, that means the number three resource, metals, is the most valuable. And that's what the, what's on this island. But they know they, they don't have time to get the sea panda home. So she's going to load up the two that the Spanish chucked over there. That's actually a textiles resource. Just She's going to load that up and then see what else I can put on. So I guess, I guess Nemo's plans doesn't take up cargo space either. Nice. Well, that's good. All right. So she only need... Oh, well, she doesn't have much cargo, though. Because the Runes of Power takes up a space to crew, so she only has two cargo spaces open, which is disappointing. I don't know if she's going to keep the spices long term. We'll see what happens with that. Five cargo. So three other things. She can only take two resources, but she gets a textiles token and a metals token. So a good turn, especially with the Frond of Thaga. River Crystal. Just going to be moving S plus S. And I don't think she's going to get... She's not going to get her resources home in time to cash them in. But, oh well. The Sea Rain and I think the Sea Lily is the ship at the southern end of their home island. These two were launched last turn by the Jades with the initial haul that the Sea Panda got. So the Sea Rain is going to take advantage of this trade current, head north. She might go to the Metals Island or she might head farther north. Uh, to see what's out there, but we'll see. I don't know yet. I guess the Jades don't know yet either. Depends on the resource roll. Depends on how the economy values fluctuate. Sea Lily. Okay, that's not too good. So she's only moving S plus S. Not really room for Helmsman, realistically, with only two cargo. So she's going to be kind of like the Sea... Um, oh, the Tiger Lily, I should say, which is the turtle ship that has... Similar capabilities. She's moving home right now. Three cargo, but also only SSS SS speed, but only five points. So not a bad deal overall as a gold runner. All right, so clock cannon. That's not very useful. <laughs> so that's their five ships. So the Jade, the Jade Rebellion is done. Just gonna peek, make sure the stream is okay. Alrighty. Okay, even though it says the resolution is not supported, the stream and the recording both seem to be working okay and better, if anything. So, I think I'm just going to keep it the way I, I change. I basically changed the resolution from like 1280 times something, or thir it was like 1366 to like, it was like 1024 by 580, some, something like that. So, in the video settings or whatever. All right, so the jades are done. I don't want to get too off track here. Um, so after the Jades, we've got the Spanish. They've had kind of an interesting game so far. Right now, they're just getting gold, though. They're getting resources. They had a brief kind of, uh, there was no combat. They had a little run-in with the Pirates early on, so the Pirates aren't too happy with the Spanish. The Spanish basically were able to use the S-Exploring ability of the Pacifica, this custom 5 master you see right there, to basically steal this home island out from underneath the Pirates who had, um... I think docked at it first, or at least they were right there anyway, so. The Pacific also find two copies of the Fireworks UT, as you just saw there. They've got a gold targeting scope. These two ships are moving the same speed, so I'm going to move them at the same time. Well, for the most part, I'm going to get on track here. Okay. Because if you select uh, multiple ships, if you click and then press shift and hold it down. You can select multiple ships at the same time. This is useful for native canoes that are moving in the same with the same heading or all at once. Um, if they have the same uh, move speed or base, or the same speed, I should say. So I guess that's it. Spanish, they're just moving around, sailing at a good clip, just not uh, to islands yet, either home or wild. So the, the pirates are next. So that'll be kind of interesting, I think. They're finally getting on track a bit here. The pirates got, they had runes of death at their home island, which held up the black crow for at least one turn, possibly more if I remember. And then the brigands nation is still in the northeast from message in a bottle. So they've had basically the Spanish kind of grabbed the home island from where the pirates were probably going to settle their home island. The Spanish weren't right there when it happened. And then they had some bad UT luck since then. So the pirates are off to a bit of a slow start but they're looking to recover, and so far they're, 
they're getting back on track. So, And, of course, they're the best factor in the game, so I think they'll be fine long-term, to say the least. They've got Turtles headed home, too, and I don't think that Tangier is really concerned with the Turtles, especially because she doesn't know which faction um, they're from. Like, the factions, I don't know, just kind of playing it kind of random with what the factions know and don't know in terms of their, uh, like, global knowledge. So they can have a good look around the map, but I don't want everything to be known to all fleets or factions at the same time, because that would just be kind of um, unrealistic, I guess. So the Brigands Nation, I still got to roll for the Lost Genie of Arabia. I was going to do this first action first. I should roll for the Genie, but oh, I forgot. So, All right, so the Genie... I think changes factions on a rolls of one through three. Let me just make sure. So we got a two. Yeah, so random nationality in play. All right, so I gotta get the random number generator here. So let me, I'm gonna go from factions one to 11 to include the Dutch. They've been added into the Vassal module as the 11th faction, but the genie does not go back to being pirate and he's proving to be a pretty crappy crew. Um, probably because of how many factions are in play. Um, yeah, if there weren't so many factions in play, it would be easier to use him, I suppose. Because the odds of him going back to being a pirate would go up. But that's not the case here. So, thanks for watching if anybody's tuned in. And so number three faction... Uh, I think it's the curse. Let me just get rid of the jade crew chip. Yeah, the curse started the third one. Just gonna put that there. And then she's got, she's overloaded because John's hook allows crew to not take up cargo space, which is awesome for a hybrid. Brigand's Nation is already a hybrid type ship. And then you put that aboard. I mean, her cannons aren't great, but between the cargo, she's an interesting ship. Another custom from Pirates of the Epic Seas, which I'll probably launch from tonight, I would think. Mostly just sailing around so far, though. Let me just make sure the UTs on the Black Crow aren't relevant yet. Nope. Nope. Alright, so they both have to do with combat, so I don't need to worry about those. So I moved the Turtles in both ships, so that's the Pirates. And then, I don't know if this is something weird to me. This Anonymous Buffalo. Um, I've noticed this on my spreadsheets once in a while, like my custom spreadsheet and the master spreadsheet. I don't know if that's me or not. Because sometimes it shows up kind of often, but I don't think people are really looking at my those two spreadsheets, especially not the customs one. The master spreadsheet I could understand, but I don't know. I'm just kind of skeptical that it's not me, but I don't know. So kind of amusing to think about, but who knows. So, because normally when I edit in the past, and even recently too, it doesn't show up, but now it's been, it's been showing up more recently. So either there's some weird glitching with Google Docs or... I guess maybe my custom spreadsheet is becoming more popular, so that's cool. Oh, and speaking of which, Pirates of the Epic Seas is uh, at close to 875 total game pieces now. So I've kind of started the march to 1,000. I'm kind of hesitant to mention that in the forum on the custom ship thread at Pirates of Ben, but because I don't know if I'm going to get to 1,000 this year, let alone, you know, soon. But but ideally, I will, because it's awesome. <laughs> Uh, so that really makes the set more epic if I can get to a four-digit number. It kind of that's not that hard, at least for me, with all my pirates uh, experience and the love of the game. It's not that hard to make a custom set with like multiple hundreds of game pieces, but a thousand. That's like I don't think that's been done yet. So, uh, all right. So the Americans are next, and the Stellar. I guess I'll do her first because she's right there. We were just talking about her. She does not have an explorer board, and her ability is board, maybe? Nope, hold on, the raider. All right. So she can't explore this island yet either. So the Coursers will be the first to discover a resource there. She's going to, the Stellar, the Americans and the Corsairs have already met in two different locations, because the Pharaoh's Legacy actually met with, not on purpose, but she saw the Deceptive Bounty, and basically the Corsairs... So they kind of, the Americans basically told them they were going to make that their home island that you see there. And the Ferris Legacy was like, whatever. So, or the crew aboard, anyway. So, but now the Deceptive Bounty has been 
she got the Whirlpool UT, which is why she's at this island already, even though that was only like a couple turns ago. Um, so she'll explore. So the Americans, I guess this is their first wild island exploration of the game, I believe. Because the Stellar looks like will be the second. Oh, the Anchor is she in a she's at an island too, the Curse. It already has a resource and no UTs. Hey, I'll just do that first. I like to do well. Usually I like to do the harder stuff first, but or the more time-consuming stuff first. But well, actually that's not always true. I don't know. I think I'm just talking too much. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it depends on the fleet and, like, where it is in the campaign game, stuff like that, so... Anyway. So the Anchor... I think she has four cargo. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure in a second, but... So she'll take aboard three metals tokens. And I gotta mark that. Island is explored through the Americans. So the Cursed found this island when it was a little bit more to the northeast. And then Bad Maps UT actually moved it. So, let me get the dark blue token, which is what I like to use for the Americans. I like using light blue for the French. That's that. And I'm kind of, it doesn't matter at all, but sometimes, it doesn't look like I did it for the curse, but sometimes I'm trying to place the explored marker tokens, like where the ship actually explored the island, but it's kind of pointless. <laughs> kind of... Pointless details, I guess, but or trivial details. All right, Necklace of the Sky. I've already seen that one, I think. Unless I'm thinking of CG4, but nice. So this one is a really awesome one. So you can reveal it after loading it face down to dog the ship at any wild island. So it's like a free teleport. So then you can't use it again, but other fleets could though. So that's like, that is so interesting and so strategic. Like, they'll probably, basically, they're probably going to save it for a big ship and then maybe use that to launch, like, a surprise attack is kind of one of the obvious ways to use it. But, uh, Mirror of Archimedes, this one I don't like. Um, it's just overly complicated to use and it's not that effective. Desperate Colony, this one is from El Cazador's uh, Rise of the Moon Sorcerer set. Um, at least I'm pretty darn sure that's the set. Do not load this unique treasure. Instead, when a dock, when a ship docks at this island, you may remove a crew from the ship from the game and replace it with gold equal to half its point cost rounded down. All right. I'm not going to do that right now. This is kind of interesting, though. Yeah. When a ship docks. When they dock. Okay. You may remove a crew. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of an interesting concept. That's an interesting one. I'll have to think about that one a lot more to figure out what I would want to do with it. I'm thinking about you could like increase the amount of gold in a fort if you build a fort there, but I don't know if there's probably more effective ways to do that. But and then you could also make a deal with another faction to exchange your crew for gold and then have that gold picked up by another faction as part of some kind of payment system, I guess, or some kind of deal, but since the value is halved, since the value is cut in half, it's kind of ineffective or inefficient, I guess. Huh. That's definitely one I would love to see discussion on. Feel free to comment below what your thoughts are on it. Um, there might be somebody watching, hopefully. But anyway, that that's an interesting UT. Uh, so I guess I'll get to the resource roll and six luxuries. I think that's one I haven't found too much of yet. So that's cool. I like to have some diverse resource options. I feel like there's a lot of metals and textiles out there, which I feel like was the case in, whoops, some of the other games like CG3 or Economy Edition and whatnot. All right, I'm trying to duplicate the resource so I can load it up. The Deceptive Bounty, I don't, she might have a crew. Oh, yeah, she got this from. The uh, American Home Island, this was, on, this was a UT on that island when they explored it. So, interesting one. So that's cool. So, looks like I can, I can load two, no, three. Let me, just make, let me make sure I get this right. So, she's got an, a treasure ability, but not one that's relevant right now. So, with four cargo, I think I'm just going to keep the, some of these UTs face up so I know what's going on. I, and then I don't have to flip them over. Every time I look at the, the ship's deck plate and stuff. 
that's one. That's gonna go there. So the crew is linked, so they don't take up space. Necklace of the Sky takes up a space that's down to three cargo. That doesn't take up space either. So she still has three open for luxuries. So she can take all three. And the Americans, of course, are hoping that resource will become more valuable with the upcoming change, which is going to happen right after their turn, which is right now, because I already did the anchor, and that's the end of turn 16. So let me mark that before I forget. And then I get to do the resource change, which is a pretty big deal, especially because this one took nine turns. So I'm going to write three and see what the third resource change of the game is going to be. So I'll do so I'll do value first. So the resource roll is going to be a two. So it changes a little bit. So now number one is lumber. That's going to be worth six. And then I guess luxuries would be worth five. So that's good for the Americans. So looks like it's good for the French too because they already have some luxuries. Let me just make sure I'm not messing up real quick. So on a die roll of two, yep, lumber is worth six. Luxury is five, spice is four. So resource numbers one, six, and five are in the top half of values. But food, metals, textiles are all less valuable. So metals and textiles just completely crashed. Their market just plummeted. <laughs> so that's cool. Good to have a nice change. Let me see what the duration is. So two roll for 10 turns. So I got a four and a six. So that's what I'm going to mark right here. So let's delete both of these. All right. So the Americans will be doing well. The French, we already saw them with some fives and sixes, which are spices and luxuries. So they're going to be doing well. So they're, it's almost their turn. Their turn is next. So they're going to be launching without a doubt. So I think this change is definitely going to slow things down to the point where I probably won't finish this next round of turns tonight in this session, which is fine and completely normal. So let me just make sure I write this down the way I want to. So two roll for 10 turns. So it's been a steadily decreasing resource roll, but an increasing duration. So we've gone from six to four to two, but for a longer duration each time. So maybe next time it'll be one for 12, but probably not. Alrighty, so that's pretty exciting. And the French are certainly among the excited, you could say, because they are going to launch without a doubt. Let me just, I got to do their turn first, then they can start spending, get some spendables, as they would say on the Curse of Oak Island TV show. I don't know if anybody else watches that, but anyway, it's okay. Um, I wouldn't get too excited if you haven't heard of it and you start watching it, it kind of Temper your expectations, I suppose, but the Curse of Oak Island is still fun to watch. But like most TV shows, there's too much time filler, which is why I don't watch TV pretty much ever, other than that in Survivor. So Jade and Aegis Shield are on the Unicorn Pearl. So that's cool. Interesting. All right. It's like impossible to remember the UTs on every ship. There's going to be more ships very soon. All right. Leo. So the French have been going to this island that has luxuries, so they're just gonna keep going there. They haven't they don't have a lumber island, I guess. So they're just gonna milk that. That they're just basically gonna go to this island repeatedly for a long time. <laughs> or for like this entire ten turn duration probably. That's one thing I'm a little bit worried about in this game is not having enough combat early and not like I feel like factions might just stick to their close islands and just hoard resources, so um, I don't want to, I'm not going to create like storylines on purpose or like rig anything, but there might be, there might come a time in the somewhat near future where I have to kind of spike things up a little bit, get things going with the combat and empire, you know, aspects of things. I don't really want like a long arms race for months before anything happens, so, um, but with all the UTs and the whirlpools, I think it'll be pretty easy for factions to, like, encounter each other and meet new factions and whatnot, so. Okay. So, Jujinut is going home. 
and she doesn't have a helmet on anymore. Okay, so that's the French turn. I'm just gonna see what they have on their home island just to make sure I'm not missing anything, and then they can launch without a doubt. Probably launch stuff from Pirates of the Epic Seas. Dry powder. Dry powder. Fake Roman sword, which came from the Chris Volk on the TV show. So they've got four, let me just make sure here. They've got four luxuries tokens. So that's going to be 20 gold, I think. Let me just make sure I'm doing it right, especially with the new change that I'm not used to quite yet. So die roll of two. Luxuries are worth five. So times four is 20. And then I've got two spices tokens, which are worth four apiece. So they've got 28 gold to spend. And I'm just going to get that up before I forget about it. So 28. So I'm going to go to the custom spreadsheet and see what I can find. is it encoding overloaded I already changed it so whatever so got out of the rankings threads I don't need this one anymore actually I don't need either one I guess so I'm gonna launch they launched the swan from Pirates of the Epic Seas then I'm getting the Lebelul as well 
French don't have too many good gold runners in Epic Seas. They've got, they've, I mean, they've got some okay ones. Ocelot is alright. Uh, I've already launched the Bijou de Newt and Paleo. Paleo is probably the best one. Unicorn Pro, yeah, they, they've basically already launched the, the ones that are decent. So, they've got some big ships with decent cargo, but they don't really want to spend that much on one ship yet, sort of, and they've just got better options here, obviously. So, and in this game, I don't really, I don't have to worry about not wanting to use OP pieces, because I'm not playing against anybody in real life, so, which I sometimes do in some campaign games, depending on various factors, quite a lot of factors, really. So, but here, they're just going to go all out right now. <laughs> well, not quite. I mean, they could have launched the Fallen Marine and the PK Peak instead of the Swan, but I want to use my customs and test them out and whatnot. So, I mean, the Swan is a really basic custom. It's not, it doesn't really need playtesting to determine it's going to cost, really. But. So, the Bay Lul, of course, is one of the best gold runners ever. And she's overpowered because she has a negative ability, kind of similar to the Banshee's Cry. She's not as overpowered, of course. Wing Catcher. Sinks when her last mass is limited. And that's why she's too cheap, but oh well. Not my fault. So there she is. <laughs> and I mean I could decrease the or increase the cost, but that's just that opens a can of worms. So they have three points left, because I'm putting a Helmsman on both ships. That's 21 plus 4 is 25. They have three points left over. So I don't know if we're going to spend it or not. They, well, yeah, they will. Because they need a... They're going to get a Helmsman back on the Bijou de Newt. She lost her Helmsman early in the game. I can't even remember to what. I guess a negative T or something. But... Um, let me try to get this over. This is where I get kind of too detailed. I try to have the deck plates like exactly together matched up, but usually it's kind of a futile waste of time. Well, not really, but a little bit. Anyway, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's nice when it is. All right, so I'll put the crew here. I'm just duplicating. I'm just hitting CTRL-C to copy the helmsman, put those on. So yeah, 14, 11, oh, and then I need one more Helmsman. And then they'll have one gold left. I don't know. They might put an, an Oarsman, but probably not. I think they're just going to keep the gold. They might as well. Because they're probably going to, they'll probably come up one gold short. That's one case where I do sometimes save gold in campaign games. Not so much save gold, but if I have one, one left, sometimes that one gold will come in a lot more handy on the next launch if you're one gold short than getting an extra Oarsman or Explorer for a ship I'm launching now that is completely relevant. So just depends on the situation. If I was launching gunships, I'd probably use the one for an oarsman or a fire shot or something. But in this case, I'll probably have more need for it next time to get an extra crew or a slightly better ship. Or next time I might have another one gold left over from that cashing in, and then I can combine them to get a helmsman rather than two oarsmen I don't really need yet. So anyway... As the game goes on, there'll probably be more strategy talk like that, campaign game strategy, things like that, so. Okay. That's the French launch, and their turn is over. They cashed in, got their got their new ships, and now I'm on to the Cursed, of course. We have had quite the adventures already, and this is going to be a complicated turn. All right. Okay. Need a drink for this turn. <laughs> okay. So now I gotta figure this out. Um, let me see if I can select this entire deck plate to see what the heck is going on here. This could be completely impossible to understand. Yeah, this is like some advanced level stuff. Oh boy. So basically, the uh, this is not the dungeon, that's a pirate ship. The Opal Shrine has three cargo, extended range. It's kind of a bizarre ship. This is another custom, of course. And she's got her own UTs, so that makes it even more complicated. I guess they don't take up space. 
I don't know what these are. John's Cutlass and the Head of Coil Zaki, however you pronounce it. I like the Ja sound of the XAU. Anyway, John's Cutlass, when supporting party, and when Oh, okay, so it's UT Massacre. Or wait, oh, I said cargo. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Interesting. Wow, that's perfect for the curse. Ooh. They gotta put that on their home island or something. Oh my god. I can't wait to do that. Jeez. Uh, that's so perfect for the curse. Same with this one. This is Rise of the Moon Sorcerer. The main, you know, key piece from that. Uh, yeah, so this is cool. Um... Alright, so she's got some cool UTs already that she probably needs to put on the home island or on a better ship. So basically what I'm doing is, I guess, the feated killness, I guess, is giving the explore action right now to, uh, boy, to explore the Opal Shrine. And she's going to give her some positive UTs, I guess, or at least some of them. She doesn't want to give her any negatives. So the reason this is part of the reason this is bizarre. I'm gonna move these down so I separate them. The Aegis Shield from Xerix. I'm pretty sure from Xerix. This ship cannot be affected by UTs unless you permit it. Trigger cannot be unloaded. So she can't give that to the Opal Shrine. The feat that Kellen basically is not a good ship. At least not really. And the Opal Shrine is really fast, so she's gonna start distributing the positive UTs throughout the fleet or whatever. And basically, the Feated Kilness got hit with uh, Pandora's box, but because the curse... I did a house rule where the curse plays the first UT, which was the shield, which would protect from them from any negative UTs other factions placed. So therefore, since other factions knew that negative UTs wouldn't have any effect on the ship, a lot of them put positive ones, so that's why there's a mix of positive and negative. And some factions just don't want to, you know, you don't necessarily want to piss off the curse early in the game. It's not always... that could be... a that could backfire, so. Um, Alright, so I gotta just start transferring. I guess I'll just, I guess I don't really need to think about it very much. Elizabeth's piece of eight um, is kind of an interesting one because the feed Kilness could actually use that to sacrifice her own actions when she once she gets home, but. Yeah, it's kind of, it's just a bizarre ship. Um, I think Elizabeth's piece of eight is probably just gonna stay on the home island because I think the cursed have. They definitely have even worse ships than the Feated Kilness to use with the Elizabeth Piece of Eight to give pirate ships in action. So, Wine, Runes of the Serpent. That's a really weird one. That's the Iceberg Teleportation. There's not many icebergs. Or actually, there's none. There still aren't any, I guess. But there probably could be some created, of course. Alright, so the Aegis Shield has to stay aboard. The nice thing about this is... I guess none of these UTTs take up treasure, except for probably this one. Okay, yeah, so it's loaded face up, but it takes up a cargo space. Um, gotta keep that in mind. I guess the exploding shot is gonna be taken. Choose a player, use an equivalent shot in the name, assign the ship. That equivalent does not. Ah, oh God, I remember this already. I don't remember the answer though. I can't remember if the uh, equipment from the ammunition UT takes up cargo space. Whoops, I gotta get the code up. I don't remember if it takes up space on a ship it gets transferred to, or if it doesn't take up space ever. So, now I think they I asked this in the rules thread, but I don't know. And it's gonna take it's gonna bog me down too much. Counts towards the ship's point limit. Maybe I'll try to load it and see. Yeah, there's the thread, so it might take some time to load, but, um, actually, nope, alright, cool. Got my site speed up to a reasonable level, at least on, hopefully, most of the pages. I still gotta check some of, some of them, but, ah, so, ammunition. Nope, alright, I don't know. Alright, too bad. So, I'm just gonna say it can't, it doesn't take up car space. I think I'm just gonna dump DT, I don't. I don't, I'm not worried about this. I guess I should just take up cargo space. Oh, I guess I won't. Alright, I'm gonna put it over the top of it. This is just kind of awkward. I knew this was gonna be a rough turn, because there's just... There's a lot to unpack, obviously. So, 
I guess I'm just going to transfer both to the Opal Shrine, and uh, therefore the Exploding Shot doesn't take up cover space. Runes of the Serpent does. None of these other UTs do. So she still has two open cargo spaces. So I think she's going to load a couple of these. Yeah, she's going to load up. I don't know where I should even put them. I'll just put them over here. Yeah, let me... I don't know how much of this is going to go on the home island. I'm trying to keep the equipment below the UT so I know it doesn't take up the cover space. But anyway, maybe I'll look in the miniature trading rules thread tonight if I can remember. Let me make a note about it. I don't know if I'll get to this anytime soon, but I'm going to make a new line here. So, alright, so with that, the feeded conus will finally be full of stuff. Yeah, it looks like I'll barely be able to get these UTs aboard. I'm just trying to get them to better ships and get them distributed throughout the fleet. So I'll look at those again once the feeded kilness gets home or whatever. So now the feeded kilness just has three negative UTs that have no effect with the Aegis shield. And she's got one leftover token, the metals cargo. Alrighty. Alright, that was something I've been, like, I'm almost dreading a tiny bit, just because it's kind of complicated and a little bit weird, awkward, but... So that's that. And actually, well, that, that's not, that's not that, actually. That's not that, as they would say in Seinfeld. Because the Opal Shrine hasn't been given an action, so she can start, she can get out of there. She doesn't want those runes of death, so she's going to hightail it back home. Alrighty. And then I can finally move the other curse chips. Yeah, so that's nice. Get the, you know, more difficult stuff out of the way right away. And then the Death Lullaby. Unfortunately, the resources would have been worth six gold each last turn, and... Now the market in metals has crashed, and they're only worth, um, I think, two apiece or something. They do have some luxuries, though, so they can, they can substitute those in and still launch this turn. And she's got a UT. Let me see if I want to dump this. Which is brew. Yeah, she's probably not going to use that. So she's going to put that on their home island, and they can put it on a ship that wants it more. Probably something as part of the fog hopping squadron. Check out what this is. Okay. I'm trying to think how much time. Yeah, it's been going quick. Only like 17 minutes left. Oh, I, I should have mentioned this at the start. But basically... <clears throat> let me get a drink first. <clears throat> Alright, so... I should have mentioned this at the start, but... A couple sessions ago, I had that weird 40-minute session because I thought the stream and recording weren't going to work, and I was kind of at a stopping point anyway, so I stopped it like 20 minutes early. The reason I'm not planning to do like an 80-minute or hour 20-minute session is because I almost always go over on time anyway, and I was looking at a couple past streams earlier tonight, and one of them was like an hour and 13 minutes, so I basically already used some extra time, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to do an extra 20 minutes because I've basically already done that through like the accumulation of extra minutes over an hour um, in past sessions, like over time, and that'll that'll just continue. So I don't need to do extra. Time. I've probably already done extra an extra 30 minutes or more of extra, you know, playing. So anyway, I just like to get to at least an hour. But so that's why I'm not going to do a, a extra long session, which I think I mentioned maybe doing, but I'm not. That's, there's no point really. So, um, I'd rather just keep it to the hourly hourly name, so I don't need to start messing with that all the time. Okay, so the Barrel of Monkeys is on the Nightmare, who's got two cargo left over after the Helmsman. So I had to keep the UT in mind. Oh, Lumber is the most valuable resource. Nice. Okay, when she leaves a Wild Island. Okay. Huh. 
So that's kind of... I mean, it's supposed to be random, but she's only going to have two lumber, so... Unless something bizarre happens, which won't really happen this early in the game. There's not enough wackiness and abilities in play yet to, like, switch stuff around. So... So basically what I'm saying is since it's, it's not really random, so she'll just have a lumber get stolen by the monkeys basically next turn. That's, that, that sucks though. She's going to have to dump that on some other ship. Maybe she'll transfer it to the Feated Kilness. So, and yeah, if any, yeah, so the Feated Kilness, I didn't transfer Runes of the Death to the Opal Shrine because um, I'm just kind of making the Aegis Shield as powerful as possible, I guess, so... Since it says it can't be affected, I'm saying like the runes of death, the attack ability text about possibly being transferred to another ship doesn't even apply because the shield just blocks all of it. So I'm just kind of maybe it's a little slightly overpowered interpretation of the UT custom UT, but I don't know. I don't think it's gonna really since it can't be transferred to another ship. The shield I don't think it's gonna help the curse immensely or anything. So. It helped them with the loss, though. It was a genius move on their part to introduce it. And the other, I think the reason I thought of it is because another faction found one either in this game or in CD4. That's why I thought of it. As soon as I pulled Lost, I was like, oh, let's block all the negative stuff that's about to happen. So, because Lost in a multiplayer game is crazy. You can end up with a ton of negative UTs on your ship, and that totally cripples it. Okay. So... The Cursed are in business with Lumber, most valuable resource. I still need to move the Wisp, and she's the last ship to be moved this turn. She has a beautiful collection of UTs that really will help her out when she's exploring via the Fog Hopping ability. And she's got some defenses, got some ghostliness kind of stuff going on. An Explorer that doesn't take up space. She's got an Oarsman in case she loses her mass. Or, well, or it's not even that. She's a galley anyway, so it just helps her prevent getting captured. This thing's like this is like a beast mode one master so far. <laughs> okay, so she's gonna go to a new island, just like she has in the past. She explored that island, I think, but it got it just doesn't look like it because it got wiped by one of the UTs that marks islands unexplored. And then she explored that one, I think that was last turn. So I'm thinking she might go. I think she might go southwest a little bit. They want to explore pretty much the whole map with fog hoppers, like before any other faction can do so. But they're also not super desperate to go super far from their home island right away. So, and this is still it's still a one masted galley, so they don't really want to go anywhere near any other faction. So I think this island here looks pretty good. So that's where the Wisp is going to head to with the Fog Hopping ability. So I'm going to get her over there, southwest of the Cursed Home Island. Starting to approach American and French territory a little bit. Now, it's not really their territory yet, of course. But And then with the ability, I can pop out of any Fog Bang in play. So I'm going to zoom in. Looks like the southern tip of this fog chain is probably going to give me the best chance of docking at this island this turn. So I think I'm just going to try that once I can get it going here. Yeah, this is pretty close to the American home island, so this is going to be interesting. At least in the in the long term between the curse and the American. Let me zoom in again just to make sure I get the fog roll right. Slight bit of lag. Not much. Okay, so... So a six roll is a good one. I don't think she'll be able to dock, but it comes out on the west side. I'm just going to get the right angle here. So she comes out right there. And now she can be given her move action. This kind of seems like too good to be true. It's weird. She may use her move action to move out of any other part. Of All right. So I feel like there's like three move actions between the hopping and then the coming out angle, and then the, the moving. And she does get there. So this is, all right, here we go again. Curse get to explore another island. She has forged papers. So that means she basically has an explorer aboard, essentially. It doesn't take up any space. So the Cursed are very happy to explore yet another wild island. They're going to be the fastest 
to explore a high number of islands without a doubt. Let's see what she gets. Here we go. I hope this isn't negative. I put the kibosh on their exploring efforts. Abandoned colony. Statue of the Archangel. That one's pretty good. Protection of David Jones. Cool. All right, that's a good haul in general. Do not load the suit in. You need treasure. Instead, when a friendly ship docks here, you re may remove you may remove from the game crew on that ship equal to the gold cost of a fort in your collection in order to build that fort on this island. You can control that fort without... Oh, God. That's crazy. You gain control of that fort without regard to its faction. So, I guess... Wow. If the French weren't in this game, I guess... I mean, I don't really want to let the curse use other factions' forts, because I have... I have like eight cursed forts in Pirates of the Epic Seas, I think. There might be more. I think it's at least eight. Oh yeah, including the LEs, there might be like ten. <laughs> so they've gone from no forts to like ten. Alright. I should count them. Um, so yeah, I guess in a in a game, they would be able to build like Paradis de la Mer, the awesome French fort, as the curse. So that's pretty powerful. Although technically they can do that anyway via the, the rules, because they don't have any forts, but if you use a fort, it's already on this island, of course. Wow. Yeah. Alright, so it's an interesting one. That's another one from Alcazador's Rise of the Moon Sorcerer. So this is going to be fun to have these UTs stay on the island. Because then other factions... Another faction could take advantage of what the Cursed found and build a fort that denies the Cursed from using this island again. That would be cool. And then this one, the Cursed found this in Vassal Campaign Game 4, actually. It's on one of their ships in that game. So, it take takes up... Oh, that's not good for the Wisp. This treasure takes up one card space and cannot be unloaded. I hate that. I hate that you can't transfer it. I don't understand that. I might make a house rule. <laughs> this is a custom. I can't remember if this is from Riz or someone else. I think it's from Riz. But can't be hit unless the camera rolls a 6. Then, from there, it's kind of similar to Relics. And, yeah, so, so that's a good one. It's a positive defensive UT, but they can't, they really don't want anything that takes up cargo space, so they're pretty disappointed to find that, actually. So I'm going to start trying to move these UTs a little bit. It's just it's going to get more and more of them. That being said, the Wisp is, they don't, I guess it's not too bad, because the Wisp, she only has two cargo anyway, so she's not really going to bring back a huge amount of resources. So, she's more of a scout exploring ship that's going to find UTs, bring them back, use them, and kind of just map out the, the whole ocean for the Cursed, along with any other frog hoppers they might launch pretty soon. So, she only has one car space open now, which she'll fill with metals, because there's another metals island now. So, that's definitely one of the more popular resources, and it's right around here. This is like some kind of metal metal ore bonanza in this area because the curse have found all three of these islands have metals on them so of course they just crashed in value the cursed are some good some bad this turn mostly a, a solid turn it's not you know they wouldn't have minded a different role for the resource but oh well they've also got lumber and that's the most valuable all of a sudden so Still doing pretty well. And speaking of which, they will cash in their luxuries. They've got two of those, it looks like. Yep. So they're going to cash those in for 10 gold and launch something. They won't have a lot of options. They don't have a lot of cheap ships. But yeah, so die roll two. Luxuries are worth five, so 10 gold total. I'm not going to put this in the calculator. It's only going to be one ship launch, I'm pretty sure. They do have a few cheap ships in uh, parts of the Epic Seas. I purposely didn't give them like all sorts of good gold runners because I don't, I don't really think Fandage factions should be like band-aided up to like keep up with the major factions. And the ones, the cheap ones they do have from this set, I've already launched. The Devil Sneer I actually made that one yesterday, Wednesday. So, but that one's only has one cargo. So, Wisp. Yeah, they pretty much have launched the good cheap ships from this set, from my custom set. 
They've got native canoes, but they don't have any cargo, so that kind of gives you an idea of me not making them really good at gold running, which is makes sense, of course, because the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have nine regular forts in the cursed faction, and then I have, I'm pretty sure, two, maybe just one, at least one limited edition fort. So cursed have at least 10 forts in Epic Seas. They're not hurting for forts at all. Um, okay, so I guess I'll get the ranking threads up again. And then from here, it's going to be almost done. So thanks for watching, anybody tuning in here. So the cursed are basically launching right now. They've got 10 gold to spend. They just cashed in luxuries. I did a resource change um, at the start of this turn. I got a two roll for 10 turns. So now lumber is the most valuable resource. The metals and the textiles markets have completely crashed, which is bad for the, the cursed, but they also have lumber, so they'll be okay. I'm getting up the top five cursed gold runner rankings page here. The Pirates with Ben, but they already have some of their decent cheap gold runners. So with only 10 gold, the cursed can't do too much. They don't have gold for the those top ships there. The Sea Duck is probably what they'll grab. Sea Red is 10, but she only has all speeds. So I'd rather have something faster. Most of these are more expensive, or I, I need something eight points or less usually. I want to have a helmsman too. Although this one I might not do a helmsman on. The Sea Duck, I'm pretty sure this will be the one they launch. Then they'll have two gold left over, so that's what I'll do. So the Sea Duck, one of their best ships. This is, of course, a captured ship from the Jade Rebellion in South China Seas, which got remade as a cursed ship in Ocean Veg. So they're going to launch her for eight gold. I could do a helmsman, but then she only have two cargo, so it's kind of just a Kind of a toss up there. And then, depending on how much time is left at the end here, I might, may or may not, do, try to do the English real quick. I can't, if they, if they have enough resources to launch, I'll probably just end the stream. But let's see where I end up first. So it was a decent session, but the, um, the South Desk. Not that it makes a difference, really, at least in the base move, of course. The resource roll, resource change has already slowed things down because the French were able to launch, now the Cursed are launching, so the factions can cash in some of their stored up resources that are now valuable for the first time, or at least the first time in a while. So, so the Sea Duck is the newest Cursed ship, so they've got eight now. They're doing pretty well. And then they're going to have a two coin face down on their home island. And let me just make sure, let me look at these UTs, make sure the Sea Duck doesn't want to loot either one of them. They're kind of just for later, which is brew, probably used for a fog hopper type thing across the Coronado. Takes up a space loaded face down, so I don't want to deal with that. And the, the English have three spices, which are worth four gold apiece, which would be 12 gold. So they're probably going to cash those in and launch. Um, so in that case, probably end it, but we'll let's see, see if there's any comments or time. Yeah, it's a minute and a half, so Eng English are going to go next time. So I'm just going to wrap things up here, save the game and whatnot. So in this session, just to recap, we'll start with the course, so I didn't even get through a full turn, which is disappointing, but at the same time, that's what's going to, you know, that's going to be inevitable going forward as things uh, kind of decelerate in terms of the the moves and whatnot. The Corsairs and the Americans are have another instance where they're at the same island. The pirates are just sailing around. The Jades have had a good time. And they're pretty excited about where they are in the game right now, the Jades are. The Spanish mostly just sailed. The Americans found a... They explored an island for the first time. And then the Anchor got some medals. But the main news was the resource change, and then that enabled the French and the Curse to launch, which slowed things down a bit at the end. So I'll leave off on the English for next turn. So that was turn, the end of turn 16. 
beginning of turn 17. I leave off on the English once again. I'll try to remember to do these two things here in a moment. But other than that, that wraps up part 16 of the hourly campaign. Thanks for watching. I'll be back again soon.